We have a uh, presentation from what I will just uh, introduce as an alternate universe. Uh, I know what eSport is, but I'm going to let these guys uh, explain that to you. Uh, we've got Andres and uh, Steven who are going to uh, present for us today on an a interesting, very high volume use case for uh, IP video. Gentlemen, please come on up. Thank you. <coughs> Hi, nice to meet you. Uh, we are happy to be here, so thanks for inviting us. Uh, my name is Andreas Jacobi. I'm one of the co-founder and CEO uh, at Make.TV. We are providing a solution. It's called the Live Video Cloud. Um, it's a software as a service, and we are providing that to broadcasters and publishers to enable them to ingest live video feeds from all over the world, to, to route these feeds within the cloud, and to distribute them to multiple platforms. We are running on Azure, on AWS, and on Google Cloud. Our servers are running in more than 150 data centers. And the main ch challenge is always to get good quality and to keep good quality uh, in a reliable way. And I am um, very happy that uh, Stephen, Director of Broadcast Engineering and uh, Streaming at ESL, the biggest eSport publisher in the world, is joining me here today. And um, we'll explain with me together what we are doing uh, together because ESL is one of our biggest customers in the eSports segment. So thank you for joining me and uh, please introduce yourself and maybe start with um, the ESL definition of eSports. So what is eSport and, uh, and then feel free to just make an introduction of what we are doing together. Sure. <laughs> uh, so as you already said, uh, I work for ESL, we're the largest esports company in the world. Uh, esports, for those who don't know, is competitive gaming. And what we mean by that is people playing computer games, like competitively as sport, on a national, international and professional level. So over the last few years, esports has, it's been around for over 10 years, I think. But the last few years, it's really exploded, it's huge. We regularly sell out arenas, international arenas, like from 5,000 people, 15,000 people higher. Uh, people coming to watch computer games get played competitively. Uh, at ESL, we run some of the biggest events in the world. So specifically, ESL 1 and IEM, which is the Intel Extreme Masters, are two of the biggest tournaments. That's the equivalent for us of, you know, it's Wimbledon, it's the Super Bowl, it's the World Cup. It's the, those are the biggest esports tournaments in the world. The sold out arena and millions of people watching online. We do everything from start to finish for those events. So putting on the event, the tournament, the players, everything through the TV production and to the content distribution and streaming. Uh, I guess specifically, esports, just like real sports, uh, like football, all the, all the traditional sports, because esports is a real sport. Uh, we have all the same things that go along hand with that. So for the World Cup, you have the stadium, the fans, all of the support staff, you have the TV crews, the trucks, the studios, commentators, everything that goes with that. We have all the same stuff uh, to the same scale, really, and in some ways bigger scale when it comes to digital platforms. The difference is we do it with far fewer resources and we do it far more regularly. So we have an event every month, two events a month, or sometimes two events simultaneously at the different parts of the world. Those events as well are not one-off events where everything is poured into, into one day. Like usually they range from four days to six days. We have super festivals that happen every year, uh, one specifically in Poland, IEM and ESL1 Katowice, which runs for two weeks and it's just tournament after tournament. The, the really what defines the difference between what we do versus what traditional sports does, I think, is the, the scale and the resources that we use to do it. And that's, I guess, what we're here to talk about today, and specifically ESL1 Cologne is one of our biggest events. How we achieve that scale with the resources we have and how innovative we have to be to make that happen. So. Make TV specifically, we do a lot of our content distribution, digital distribution through them. 
we're talking about the contribution and transcoding delivery, the middle part, not delivery to the viewers, because we don't, ESL doesn't deliver any content directly to the viewers. We make media rights deals for that with Twitch, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, like, or all simultaneously, as the case may be for an event like this. Yeah, so the beauty here with Stephen is that um, he worked as a professional broadcast engineer in, in sports. So he was used to work with uh, lots of resources and hardware and cables and switching on the streaming side and in the esports sector. Uh, he, um, he switched to work um, with less resources, with cloud-based infrastructure and so forth. Um, but the quality requirements, they did not change. The opposite was the case. Esport content is very, very critical when it comes to quality. So as a vendor for ESL, we discovered, especially in our early days of our collaboration, that they're crazy, um, what is the right word for that? The requirements, the quality requirements are higher than uh, um, of some of our broadcast customers. And the audience is going crazy if there's a frame drop. Uh, and the requirements for the codex uh, are super. Also, we were not out of that game. We, built, we developed our live video cloud for broadcasters, especially in the field of news to acquire live video from sometimes you and me at the right time at the right location, from mobiles, from semi-professional and professional cameras. And then eSport customers like ESL and, and DreamHack and Beyond the Summit uh, realized that our technology has two advantages for them nobody else can, can provide. The first is we are separating ingest and output. So we're ingesting always close to where the feed is created to avoid the situation that a feed goes to the public internet and uh, goes through different peerings, which always results at the end in dropping quality. Um, and on, so after ingesting the feed, we take care that, for example, if you're sitting in Manila streaming and the output should be used in Virginia, we are able to take care that we have a stable signal flow and no, um, uh, no, no frame drops and so forth until uh, the feed is... Uh, um, uh, yeah, at the ingest of uh, kind of the destination, uh, like Facebook, Twitch, and so forth, or custom CDNs, uh, live stream destinations who are providing uh, bet functionalities and so forth. So the infrastructure part was one of the key things why eSport customers started to use our technology. And the second uh, USP was a detailed functionality. And I just learned in the conversation with our customer, ESL, that this feature... Um, is super important and um, it stands out and it's the possibility to delay different streams. Pretty easy, you would think, but very important, especially if you are dealing with destinations where viewers are able to bet because you have to take care that on all other destinations the feed is delayed, that you're not able to watch, right, and know what's happening and then you're able to bet. So. It was interesting. So we learned a lot from ESL, and we are super happy today to explain you pretty briefly how a typical workflow of, um, of also the signal management and the workflow uh, is being realized. And um, maybe, uh, Stephen, you start on, let's talk at first about a classical production, right? One of these big events, let's talk about ESL, uh, also, uh, the Katowice event, for example, yep. and, and what's going on on location? How are you producing your content? I guess Katowice is a really complicated one because it's a festival, so yeah. ESL One Cologne probably is simpler because it's a, it's a single stage production in an arena, so it's, it's one stage, one tournament, and we're covering it as if it was a football match. So we have on site all the stuff you'd normally have. It's the arena, the stage, lights, cameras, all everything that goes with that players. We have the studio, we have the commentators on site. Uh, for my side with the content distribution, we're dealing with free feeds normally. So that's the program feed, which is an English localized feed on site with all advertisements. It's the it's the feed that we would send to Twitch to ninety percent of the viewers. Then we have a mix minus version, so people can do localized commentary, but still keep their same visuals. And then we have the world feed for takers where they want to localize everything. So there's no commercials on that. They have choice of audio channels, stemmed, whatever they want to do. We generate all those on site. And then we have our own custom encoding solutions that we travel around. They send everything to the cloud. It gets compressed, uh, encoded, the H.264 sent to as RTMP to make TV's platform. And then from there, in the center area, that's where we do all of our 
first stage distribution work. So transcoding, changing resolutions, changing frame rates, changing bit rates specifically, and then pushing to all the different partners who are going to take that, or they can pull from there as well. That would be a basic summary of the, of the workload. Right. And then on the output side, uh, so you are sometimes hitting up to seven destinations at the same time. Yeah, I mean, nowadays I would say that's even the minimum. Like for, for ESL1 Cologne this year, I, I don't think we ever had less than 25 like, active outputs. Yeah. Like, and every one of those, uh, mo that's 25 like, distinct routes, right. I guess, that are, are output engines, I guess you would put yeah, it. But that, engine, but yeah, right. but there's more than 25 takers, so they all require different versions or they want different flavors of the same content. So our, our contribution, uh, sorry, our distribution is, is really pretty big for these events, uh, considering this is only for digital platforms. So we, the whole focus for us is what you touched on at the start. We, our quality demands are just as high as any other sports, in some ways higher. Like there's, everything has to be 1080p60, it has to be perfect 1080p60, and it has to be super low bit rate. So nothing we do can exceed 6 Mbit. Like that is as high as we can go, because that is Twitch's limit, and they are where most of our viewers are watching. It depends on the event, it could be Facebook, it could be whoever is the, the main rights holder. But we are extremely limited, and everything we do is over the public internet as well, which is the most important part. Uh, we need the flexibility to be wherever we need to be, have super high reliability, super high quality, complete flexibility, complete scale, <laughs> but we have, you know, we, we don't have the fixed dedicated infrastructure, I guess, that you would use to do this in TV traditionally. Yeah, so what is the typical um, qualification or skill level a screaming engineer on location needs to be able to manage this amount of volume from, in this case, it's one location where the content is created. Yeah. It's pretty easy from an ingest side. We can prepare the ingest capacity in advance if we know there's an event. Uh, ESL is doing on a regular base like things we can't predict and we have no idea where they are doing 200 hours of live video content, other way they are creating tours. Uh, 200 hours of live video content tomorrow. Right? So, uh, that is more challenging. But in the case of these events, we, the ingest side is pretty easy to prepare. What, what does, on the output side, it's a bit different, but what does um, a streaming engineer on location needs to know and how many people do you have there, especially for that job, um, uh, to be able to, to guarantee like uh, quality, reliability, yeah. and be on time? That's probably one of the interesting parts for us because we Originally, it would be quite a large team. You'd have one or two engineers on site, and then you would have your off-site staff, so like in the MCR position. And through using a solution like this and through our own custom encoding solutions that we build and run, we can reduce that. So you still need, uh, you still need a, a high level of understanding about what is going on and how to operate the system, but the experience can be hugely reduced. So before, like for me, I've been focusing specifically on streaming for almost 10 years now and finding people who are less of the traditional broadcast mindset so they can easily adapt to this environment uh, is quite challenging. So now we can use less engineers and those engineers can be newer to the field. So you can have people with only a few years experience or very little experience, but they can be quickly taught, this is how to run our encoders on site and then this is how you use our distribution platform, which is all in the cloud. So it's more about learning the workflow and learning the interface, and that can be achieved quite quickly, like much, much faster than uh, any traditional IT or traditional broadcast learning, I think. Yeah, yeah it's very impressive um, for sure um, how few people, as because we know everybody in your organization who's dealing with that, and we always realize that Steven is sometimes uh, responsible for several events at the same time, and all that content is reaching millions of people, and other customers in classical broadcasters, they, they have more time to prepare, they have typically more resources, more people uh, are involved in the production, and, and still, of course, hardware and so forth. Would you change your workflows if you would have more resources, more time, uh, or would you think like, no, it was a beauty that we started without legacy infrastructure. Uh, so that would be really an interesting yeah. question for me. Not prepared, so it's a freestyle. Uh, yeah, I mean, the short answer is absolutely not. Like, uh, this, this is, we are, we are definitely not using the approach that we use 
just because it's cheaper or just because we can use less staff. It's, it's the natural progression, I think, of how this is going. Because a lot of the stuff to do with changing to IP and making more traditional services into digital is theoretical or it's just emerging. Like we don't see that this workflow as being that. Like uh, we started this process about two years ago and now in 2018, like this is, this is a working system. Like all of our events are being done this way. Everything is being distributed in the cloud, everything over the public internet. And the scale that that allows us, you just can't replicate that without massively increasing the resources you put into our production. Like we, like as far as we're concerned and from the audience perspective, like we do the World Cup every two weeks in a different place around the world. Yeah. And doing that without, you know, unlimited resources, you just can't do it. Like you need to be super innovative with your workflows and super innovative with the technology that you put into those workflows, otherwise you just can't make it happen. I mean, so. if, if you would put all the servers you, you spin up automatically yeah. for if they were physical. the event, yeah. physical, if you would see them, you would go crazy, right? Yeah. So, um, because sometimes uh, they are like, I think at, at such an event, 150 engines, server engines uh, yeah. required to keep that up and running. Uh, the beauty, of course, with the cloud is you do not see it. It's not as loud as here. Uh, and you just pay on an hourly base. So it's, uh, it's pretty affordable as well. Um, maybe because we prepared it, so maybe we go through that a bit. Like um, the, the feed is created, as Stephen mentioned, classical on location. Uh, it's encoded, so ingested. It's not an, it's not an uncompressed file, which is in this ingested in the cloud. Um, and the regional ingest part is very important, as I mentioned. So the first mile to the ingest point has to be as close as possible, um, or as short as possible is the right wording. Um, everything is recorded in the cloud as well. Uh, for highlight productions, for near life usage, and, and for the storage. After recording in the cloud, uh, these files, or while recording, these files are available as growing files. And post production environments are able to get access to that, to create directly highlights, and to play the highlights back to the production team if they want to use it. Um, and the, the routing is done. Uh, in, in these cases of these events on the, in the same data center where the ingest is because there's m mostly no reason to choose a different data center. And then it's distributed via push mechanisms to different platforms. These feeds are also available uh, as pull, uh, pull resources. In, in your use cases, uh, you're mostly pushing the streams to live stream destinations. In use cases where our system is used in combination with classical infrastructure, uh, an EBS, I just saw these guys, uh, are pulling out our outputs as network feeds, and then they're using our outputs and inputs in their classical hardware environment. Classical, uh, a good example here is Fox Sports. They're doing big sport events, professional productions on location. They're extending the production input capability with incentivizing viewers in the stadium to contribute with, mobile f uh, with their mobile phone live video feeds. They are sub-switching in the cloud all these feeds and routing the outputs back as inputs in their EVS machine. Of course, it also works with new tech TriCaster or other uh, um, mixing hard or software. Um, yeah, back to your use case, it's then all about uh, pushing s stable signals to these platforms and getting all the data back which is necessary to track and monitor scalability and performance. So via the API integrations with Twitch and Facebook and so forth, uh, we are able to, to pull out all the performance information, how many people are watching and so forth. That's quite easy. More challenging but also important is is the stream still stable on Twitch or on Facebook? So we are tracking the quality on the destination and bringing back that information to the streaming engineers on location that they are able to react. Um, sometimes, if, it, if, if something happens on the destination side, the, the reason is like the encoded signal or here ingest problems, right? Bandwidth capacity on the data center. Of course, our system tries to automatically use the performance information from, uh, from the destination to self-heal, is that the right wording, to automatically repair the system. Yeah? So for example, to spin up additional engines, 
or to change the routes, to spin up another engine in a different data center, uh, and so forth. But sometimes uh, it's still a problem and an issue. And, and in this situation, it's most important, because it's life, that the, the people on location are able to see and identify quickly where is the problem in the workflow and what can I do to fix it. And if they're not able to do it, they call our 24-7 support and they have some additional uh, monitoring capacity. So that's, that's why flexibility is so important to us, though, because you, you have all that information and you can like, digest it, look at it, problem solve, but then you have the flexibility to do something about it. Because yeah. if you're in a traditional environment, quite a lot of the time, you know, your, your roots are fixed, everything is in place, and there isn't that many options here. But we have the flexibility to make changes. If we see a stream is not performing well, we can send it to another location. We can spin up a server in another place, an output engine. We can, I mean, you said before, there, we rarely would have the production in a different data center, but you still have that option. So you, you have a lot of flexibility to try and correct problems or address problems as they're happening or to have parallel redundancy if you want that. And it can all be done reasonably unplanned, which is really important to us because in, in eSports, a lot of the, like the main rights holders, they, they're booked up in advance, so we know we're gonna deliver to those. But there's a lot of on-demand, people drop in, drop out, they want different kinds of content, and it's a super dynamic environment. So you never really know day to day what you might have to do and you need a system that can respond to that because if you need an encoder and a decoder for a taker that just doesn't work in our business like there we don't have the the amount of lead up time to make that happen you need to be able to say okay we want to take this content uh, halfway through the event or a couple of days before the event and we need to be able to just make that happen and then if there's a problem we need to be able to address it yeah it's one of the it's one of the most important aspects of doing this in the cloud for us is it's the flexibility and the scalability. You just don't get that when you're doing this with physical like traditional infrastructure. Yeah. So as a vendor, maybe one more comment and then we can start to to get some questions. Most interesting for us at this IBC was that um, our our customer in, in in the news one of the biggest our biggest customer in news, Al Jazeera, decided to use us to build the first newsroom in the cloud. Uh, so the idea here is to really start building up a master control in the cloud, that 200 offices and contributors from all over the world can collaborate on the same streams, on the same contents, uh, and to become more quickly, uh, faster in, in acquisition, and uh, to be able to easily exchange content between offices. And what's, what was very, very interesting for me is that the list of requirements from Al Jazeera and the list of requirements from Steven from ESL were totally similar. It was the same in regards to more or less everything. And, and we were super surprised, yeah? Because initially we thought it has nothing to do. And as a startup or a pretty young company, it is all about like focus, 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 yeah? on technology, on roadmap, on marketing, on everything. And the question is always, yeah, what are we able to achieve next and which are the right customers for what we achieve next? And uh, when we talk to our investors and our partners, it's all about like, what is your sweet spot yeah, in regards of customers? And, um, and now I can come back and can say like, our sweet spot is also to tell the broadcast industry that, with, that in the future we're simplifying workflows and going into the cloud from A to Z um, is like they, it's like the same. It's all also the, the basic requirements are all the same. Of course, it's different when it comes to uh, the creation of content and enrichment of content, of course, right? So, yeah, that was, I, I don't know if we talked about that, um, but um, that was pretty interesting for me. And please, uh, because you know better what you need and what you want, so what is next? So which protocols are like the future for reliable uh, uh, streaming and uh, which features are important that you can do your work better? Uh, because I guess, I don't know exactly in which area you are working, but if you are working in classical broadcast infrastructures, uh, we guess that the eSport industry or segment uh, is a good segment to look into it because they can move a bit faster. They do not have legacy infrastructure. They have to move faster at some point. And so please uh, give us an insight of your wish list, uh, what we have to build then at the end. We're, we're definitely risk takers. 
Like, I think mm. there's a lot of people who still wouldn't buy into a concept like this now. Uh, we did it two years ago. Now it's fully working. I think there's maybe fear is too strong a word, but there's definitely some level of fear about putting real broadcasts you know, like they're done the traditional way into like a cloud streaming or something similar to the esports environment. And and for us, we're so far past that. Like there, there's just no concern for us because we're. It's not like the an esports broadcast can be dismissed because it's just like you know a website like twitch or it's just a youtube stream like we're delivering this to live television like linear channels as well like we're doing everything that everybody else is doing just in the cloud with far lower resources really uh, we have the same levels of redundancy where we want to go in the future it's difficult to say <laughs> like there's the obvious things where everybody wants to go to better resolution better quality so everybody's looking at ultra hd and 4k uh, in terms of the technology that does it, that's one of the good things about a cloud method is it, we are not really fixed into anything. So we're, we're not investing in like proprietary hardware or proprietary workflows. We're not putting in dedicated systems. Uh, we are just staying really flexible. So right now we're looking at all the different options. There's all the different reliable transport protocols and different delivery for viewers and uh, HEVC. And there's all the different things to look at. For us, we get to sit back, test, do experiments, evaluate what is best, and then just apply it to our workflow, which will remain the same. It's pretty comfortable for us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so one thing is um, maybe interesting for you. So we, we just joined the SRT Alliance. It's a new uh, protocol, and it's an open source protocol, which is great, and lots of companies in the streaming industry joined that alliance. And um, that was one part, for example, Al Jazeera required that protocol and ESL required that protocol in the future. So um, take a look at it if you are in that space. It's pretty awesome. It brings uh, low latency, it brings more reliability, it brings more metadata to be able to, to switch frame accurate in the cloud and so forth. Uh, so it's definitely an improvement. Um, another thing, I mean, you mentioned uh, Codex, uh, there are some new codecs in, in evaluation right now. I would say a bit too early maybe for big broadcasters to hop onto it. Uh, but, but which codec is, you think, next year uh, the, the winner? I, I, I couldn't yeah. even say. Like, everything is still too early for me. Like, I think AV1 is super interesting, but it, it really, everything is, is really early. And I think that's, that's one of the the best things about doing work in this way. I think it's, for me, it would feel like a mistake at this point to commit to a specific workflow or a specific codec. Like, I think you need to stay really flexible. There are things that are super exciting, like SRT. It's really hard to ignore what that is capable of doing and how that can be used. Mm -hmm. uh, I think SRT from that side is definitely a game changer. I think on the, you know, the replacement for AVC H264 encoding, like that, that that's a very different discussion. I think it could still go, yeah, I'm not really sure. <laughs> yeah. So I just heard that we have, uh, I think, two minutes left. Uh, is there another slide or yep. there's maybe some yep. numbers? Just Should be an one idea more, one moment. of um, the amount of, uh, of people uh, ESL is reaching with their content. Um, we missed it. Uh, pretty impressive. Yeah. Uh, but I think we do not have to repeat that. So please feel free to give us some questions that we can use the last uh, minutes uh, accordingly. Yep, any questions? I have one, one question and then we re are really out of time. My question is in this domain, you said that uh, you guys are really sensitive to quality, that the, your consumers are very sensitive. I know when gamers are playing, for example, high frame rate and very good uh, low latency to the servers are important. This is different because the gamers aren't actually playing. So if you had to pick the one thing that you say your uh, viewers are most sensitive to, what would that be? It's, it's quality and reliability equal. Like the, the stream must never, ever fail. Like there's zero tolerance. Like we cannot go off air for a frame. Otherwise the chat explodes and then quality. And, it, and is that because, so I'm sorry to interrupt, but is no. that because in gaming the action moves so fast that if they lose something, they immediately yep. 
kind of come out of that I think, I think that's part of it. And it disrupts it. But hey, it's the same if you watch the final, the soccer World Cup final, yeah? yeah? And oh, yeah. imagine <laughs> it will break down. <laughs> there's no difference, right? Yeah, there's okay. no difference. I think there's, there's the expectation because they're used yeah. to getting their content in that way. I think it's like in TV because people just, it, they don't expect your TV to ever go off. But in, in the the cloud streaming world, there's still this sense that it's like un unreliable and things yeah, might the only go away. The only difference is you get directly the shitstorm. Well, yeah, exactly. The, the live chat. That's what yeah. I, w I was There's no say. chance to ignore. Yeah, yeah uh, you said that the, yeah. the chat channel right. explodes. That's because they're like about yeah. one and a half seconds from yeah. access to a chat where yeah. they yeah. can just immediately start giving yeah. feedback. And for, yeah. I think in the broadcast, obviously, it's a little longer. Uh, so they definitely uh, have yeah. a, a higher expectation as well, though I would say, because when in some of the UHD trials that have been happening recently, like the quality is is amazing for streaming, but still for a regular sports viewer, for like this is football, this is hockey, this is whatever, they, like this looks really good, this is good enough. For the esports viewers, it's never good enough. Like yeah. 1080p yeah. 60 is the minimum, and it has to be really good 1080p 60. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's a good chance to drop in one more USP of our technology, because if you're streaming from your Xbox or whatever directly to Twitch, and if you have an internet connectivity problem, yeah, yeah then the stream is gone. And then you have to reconnect, and it takes sometimes 30 seconds, oh, yeah. which is totally unacceptable. So we're keeping from our output engine always the connection up and running, that even if there's an input connectivity problem, then you may have a few hundred milliseconds, which is definitely enough for 500 comments in the live chat uh, or more, uh, but it's back again. Yeah, and that's, I think that's also very instructive, uh, is that operation, what we would call operations in this new in infrastructure is going to require a knowledge, uh, just little pieces like yeah. that that are best practice in order to really have the highest quality. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you.